Well, 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 I decide to go away for one week and WWE, who clearly watches ups and downs, thinks, <laughs> let's screw over Simon by putting on one of the best episodes of Monday Night Raw that we've seen in around about five years. But it's still good. It was still cool. I still watched it. And I was like, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Batista's back. Roman Reigns comes out there with probably the best segment we've seen on their Monday night show in, I don't know what, a decade? Because who couldn't feel good about that? So hey-ho, I'm still smiling. I'm still happy. But you can't focus too much on what's behind you because you will just trip up. You've got to look forward. And that's what we're going to do right now. Kind of, but kind of not because we've still got to look back a little bit. We've got to look back 24 hours to last night's episode of Monday Night Raw. And we've got to give the good bits an up and we've got to give the bad bits are down. My name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. Let's up those downs for Monday Night Raw. Raw start with Roman Reigns arriving and getting cheered like the damn hero he is. And much like seven days ago, this was just a wonderful, heartwarming moment. And even lovelier, it happened within the confines of professional wrestling. I'm all good with that and hearing everybody in the crowd chant his name with glee, well, it made me feel all fuzzy inside. Give it an up. We did get a rundown of what happened last week, but much like we discussed at the start of this episode of Ups and Downs, you can't look too far in the past because you've got to look forward. He said it's time to talk about a kind of roadblock that's standing in his way because he knows what he wants now that he has returned to WWE and he called out his brother, not literally, Seth Rollins. Now the cool thing straight away is all the underlying tones that hopefully we are building towards. Roman Reigns clearly wants his Universal title back, but unfortunately the person standing in his way is Seth Rollins because Seth Rollins has got a match against Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship at WrestleMania 35. They both acknowledge that they know what it's like to have to give up a title without actually losing it, and there's a crazy little fact for you in the future when you're doing some kind of wrestling quiz. And the long story short is this. Roman was like, look pal, I ain't gonna worry about it now. You go to WrestleMania, you do what you gotta do, you slay the beast, but then maybe I'm gonna be waiting for you. He didn't say that, but it was certainly implied. It certainly would be interesting, but before that we gotta address the elephant in the room. And the elephant in this instance is Dean Ambrose. Probably a gimmick that WWE has actually pitched to Dean. Ambrose the Elephant, because let's face it, he's done everything else. Anyway, the point of all of this is that Roman wants to reunite the Shield for one last time. And obviously, Seth was a little bit coy about that, because of course he will. Imagine your mate had taken advantage of somebody else's illness. You'd be like, look man, we don't need to worry about that, and you'd walk away. That was the case at first, but after quite a poignant chat about what life is, and we don't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow, which was like, oh my gosh, they're telling the truth, they agree to it. The unfortunate point was nobody had actually asked Dean Ambrose what he wanted, so out he popped. He had a mic in his hand, but before he could say a word, Elias appeared from nowhere. He smashed Dean Ambrose with a guitar, and when Roman and Seth went to check on Dean Ambrose, because he's crazy too, he just sauntered off. But don't worry, it was just the start of a show-long storyline. Drew McIntyre, Bobby Lashley, and Baron Corbin were being interviewed by Charlie Caruso after this. And I tell you, it instantly brought sadness to my face because I don't actually know the stats. I don't know how many times these three have taken on a combination of Kurt Angle, Braun Strowman and Finn Balor. But in my head, it is around about 622,713 times. And that is well too much. So as soon as I heard, as soon as I saw they were going to do this again, I got a fork and I thought about gouging out my eyes. But then realize that's a bad idea because it's just not worth it. You can't react to one segment of Raw with that much rage because then you get to Wednesday and be like, great. Now I can't even see, but what I can do is give it a down. It started with the bad guys saying that they'd already destroyed the shield, which was not true because I could see them getting back together before my eyes. And then, yeah, all of them beat the good guys in a match and Kurt Angle didn't even get an entrance. There were some cool bits, including Leo Rush getting charged through the barrier by Braun Strowman. And that looked badass, but ultimately it ended when Bobby Lashley hit Finn Balor with a spear and got the 1-2-3. And yes, don't forget, Finn Balor is your Intercontinental Champion. If it wasn't enough that they had won, Lashley, McIntyre and Corbin then laid waste to their now dead opponents. And I've said it once, I'll say it again. Everybody here needs more specific and clear paths as we are heading towards WrestleMania. All of this is murky, and I get it, I understand why. It does all tie into the Shield, but that doesn't mean it feels like a big slap in the face. Right, I'm sure you've noticed over the last few weeks that heavy machinery have just been getting weirder and weirder and weirder and weirder and Otis has been at the forefront of that 
and I absolutely love it. Give it enough. Here it turned out that the Ascension and a bunch of other kind of jobbers on Raw had been bad mouthing heavy machinery and all the NXT guys saying they don't deserve the chances that they're getting and straight away I thought somebody should go and tell that to EC3. Otis reacted to all of that by being really serious and really upset and it was great he played it really well and then Tucker let us know that he was going to go find a McMahon and sort all this out. I like it. And I like heavy machinery. Natalia, though, then just beat Ruby Riot in around about a two-minute match. What was that about? I mean, literally, Ruby Riot went for the quick pin. Natalia kicked out, did a quick pin of her own, and that was that. Remember that massive feud they were having a few weeks ago when Jim Neidhart was involved? Well, that's done. We're not talking about that anymore. I didn't get any of this. And yes, when it was done, Lacey Evans did a, here I come, walk out, turn around. Oh, I'm going back now. And I guess we do that because it looks like a riveting way to spend your time. Down. We then found out that Saturday Night Live host Michael Che and Colin Jost are going to be the special correspondents at WrestleMania 35. And I have no idea what that is because nobody on Raw bothered to explain it. But they did some stick here with Stephanie McMahon and Jost was playing the heel and Che was playing the face. And look, it was all right. It was decent. I appreciated that the SNL guys were happy to play up to the crowd so it can get an up here. But boy, howdy, does this go downhill. I did, however, enjoy it when Joss said he'd wrestled in high school so he could probably handle himself backstage in a WWE locker room. I mean, that is just preposterous and ridiculous. And that's why it worked. It was then time to further the Triple H and Batista feud, and I'm all good with that. It was absolutely brilliant last week. And that whole segment where Big Dave was dragging that cameraman actually felt different. But he didn't turn up to Raw because he told us via Instagram and welcome to 2019, friends. He doesn't like Philadelphia, and he may turn up in Pittsburgh next week, but he may not like it there either. So he doesn't know what he's going to do. However, Triple H did come out to cut a promo. That can get enough. He mentioned how desperate he was to celebrate not just Ric Flair's 70th birthday last week, but also the real man behind the mask, that being Richard Flair, because they've been through some tough times together. He mentioned Ric Flair being in a coma last year, and also the death of his son, it was quite emotional. It then got a bit weird as we went back to this whole look. I know everything else you've seen on the show is fake, but right now it's real. As Triple H said, this isn't something that they're selling. And also when he does look him in the face, he's not seeing his character, but he's seeing the man behind said character. But shouldn't that all be one and the same when it comes to pro wrestling? I mean, how convoluted and how confusing are we going to get? Are we going to have Big Dave versus Triple H, but also Dave Batista versus Hall of Eck? I mean, I can't keep up with that, although I will say Triple H delivered this with a real intensity. And I know it's been dividing some people online, but I thought it furthered the feud. And I'm excited to see what happens next week. Also, I do just love the idea of them clashing at WrestleMania. Because what can you say? I'm the problem. I like having nostalgia acts at the show of shows. I just think it paces it out nicely, especially because we all know that WrestleMania is going to go on for about 13 hours. From one McMahon to the next, as we have a Stephanie McMahon promo in the back. And once more, this was a little bit bizarre. Let's just run it down. She felt like Ronda Rousey had disrespected the title last week and was going to sort all that later. However, for now, she wants Becky Lynch to sign a hold harmless agreement. And if she does, she will let Becky Lynch take on Charlotte Flair at Fastlane, which is this Sunday, by the way. And whoever wins that will become the brand new Raw Women's Champion because, yes, Ronda has been stripped of the title. Okay, if it was this easy, why didn't Stephanie overturn Vince McMahon's decision as soon as he'd made it? Especially because over the last couple of weeks, Steph has been acting like, oh no, I don't know what I can do. I didn't want to suspend Vicky Lynch, but my dad did. And then here she's just reversing her decision, even though Vinnie Mac is nowhere to be seen. That's me looking for Vince McMahon. I don't think he's in my house. But now, bam! That's it. Becky Lynch is back. She's going to have a championship match at Fastlane. Although she's not because this angle changes again before we got to the end of the Raw. But we'll get to it. But yeah, look, it's still really cool. It still really works. I love everything with Stephanie McMahon and Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch and Charlotte. But this bit made absolutely no sense. Therefore, down. We then had a gauntlet match between Heavy Machinery, the B-Team, Hawkins and Ryder. And the Ascension and WWE allowed Heavy Machinery to win every single match and allowed Otis to get the pin every time. Now that's a little bit hard for me because I love Kurt Hawkins and I'm desperate to finally see him end his losing streak. Look, I got something here still. Like I said, big fan of Otis. He's kicking all the ass. Give it a damn up. More Che and Joss stuff next. And as I hinted at earlier, one was probably enough because now Joss was acting like he kept up to date with WWE and then reference the likes of the Bushwhackers, Coco Beware, and Razor Ramon. <laughs> the absolute worst bit of this is that they passed EC3, who was just spraying himself down, 
And if that doesn't sum up what WWE thinks of him, I don't know what does. And then there were some nonsense with No Way Jose and Titus O'Neil. All you need to know is, it's getting a down. Tori Wilson then got confirmed for the WWE Hall of Fame. And I've seen you all on social media. A lot of people are mad about that. But look, she was brought in to do a job in both WCW and WWE. And she did it. There's more than one way to crack an egg. She worked really hard. She can get an up. A couple of backstage segments followed this. Charlotte said she would win the title at the pay-per-view of Sunday. And also mentioned that the WWE Universe should bask in her glory. So somebody get Keith Lee on the phone. And then Seth Rollins confronted Dean Ambrose. And Ambrose turned around and said, look, Seth, I don't want to rejoin the Shield. Go away. Hilarious, that too. Because just imagine Seth, the guy that got absolutely screwed by Dean Ambrose, had to put up with all his weirdness with jabs in the ass. And it's him that goes to Dean. And Dean goes, nah, mate, I don't want to do it. Because now Dean comes from South London. Still, these were all fine. They served their purpose. Give them up. What followed was even more mad because it started to come across like WWE was just making things up. As they go, Elias in the ring, he did a little song about Philadelphia, he got booed. That then transitioned into a match against Dean Ambrose, and Elias just won after the drift away. And all I could think was, why the hell would Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins even want Dean Ambrose on their team, given his recent track record? Not only did he go absolutely bonkers, but he never wins. So, that can get it down. We then switch back into an up though, because good moments are good moments. Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins came out to try and convince Dean again. He was having none of it. He walked away, then Baron Corbin, Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre arrived. They started beating up Reigns and Rollins and clearly something just magical happened in Dean's brain because he returned. He helped fight away the heels and they did the shield fist bump and everybody went crazy. So I am being a bit of a hypocrite given that once again the narrative made no sense, but if you haven't seen it, go and see it. Just the sheer joy on all their faces and how well the audience reacted to it. You can't help but smile unless you're dead inside. And if you're dead inside, you're already dead. The commentary team did say after this, and I believe it's the first time it's been referenced on Raw, that Dean Ambrose has not signed a new WWE contract. And as Renee said, he's off to pastures a little bit greener. Corey Graves didn't like that because he said, what are you talking about? We're here in the WWE, nowhere is greener. And now I totally believe that Dean Ambrose is going to re-sign, especially because that rumour has been going around the internet. Yeah, well, it was fun while it lasted, and as long as Dean Ambrose is happy, so am I. Didn't know that, did you? As long as Dean is a happy man, that's where I get my happiness from too. It's not true. Sasha Banks then lost to Tamina because Nia Jax kept getting involved, and the referee didn't give two hoots. At one point, Bailey tried to put a stop to this, and Nia just picked her up and threw her across the apron, as if she was a paper aeroplane. That allowed Tamina to smash Sasha Banks with a super kick. And that was it. One, two, three. I don't think this should have been our first feud for the Women's Tag Team Championships. Down. Also, when Tamina was in the ring and Sasha Banks' music hit, once again, Tamina looked absolutely surprised. Like, well, what's going on? I didn't know I was going to have a match against Sasha Banks. Yes, you did, Tamina. Yes, you did. And another down for all this stuff with Che and Joss, because we did one final segment. And this was not only the worst one of all of them, but also very worrying. Just asked Braun Strowman if this whole wrestling stuff was actually real. And all of a sudden I felt like I was in Kuwait and Vader was sitting at a table with The Undertaker and Strowman reacted by strangling Just and then picking him up in the air. Now, the problem here was we cut to a commercial and when we came back from commercial, Just was still being strangled and yet he wasn't dead. In fact, when Strowman put him down, he was absolutely fine. And that all looked really fake. What you really need to raise an eyebrow at, though, is that before Braun Strowman left, he told these two that he will see them at WrestleMania. And I cannot believe that WWE's two plans for Braun Strowman at the show of shows is last year, have him team with a 10-year-old to win the Tag Team Championships, and then this year to beat up a couple of SNL hosts. If they do do that, goodbye Braun Strowman. You've officially hit the wall. Also, what's with this new infatuation of trying to remind everybody that wrestling isn't really on the up and up? We had Ronda and Becky doing it on Twitter. Triple H said it in his promo. And then we had this skit. Can I not just pretend it's real, please? I know, I know, whatever, 2019. But I'm all right with it. It's called suspending my disbelief. I've done it since I was a kid. And I'm happy to do it until the day I die. And up for the revival versus Alistair Black and Ricochet. It did have a stupid ending, but talent always shines through. That's 
Wyatt gets the up. Basically, Gable and Rude walked out halfway through the match, took their time, but eventually did attack Dash and Dawson. That caused the DQ. And after a quick stare down with Black and Ricochet, those guys also had a little bit fight. And amazingly, the NXT dudes did that whole, oh, we're going to go over the ropes. No, we're not. We're going to flip and do our poses. And I will always love that. It's just awesome. And hey, look, if we're going to get a tag team match for the titles and it's a three-way between all these teams, I am cool with that. Right, let's get to the main event segment of Raw, which also changed some of the announcements that we'd seen earlier on in the show. But look, it was between Stephanie McMahon, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, and Ronda Rousey. And right now, they can't really do any wrong. Hence why it's getting it. At first, the whole point of this was to remind you that now we are going to have a championship match at the pay-per-view and all Becky's got to do is sign the agreement and the whole time Charlotte was just like, look, just give me the title, I'm the best, I'm great, I want it. Ronda Rousey was always going to make her presence known at some point and she did it right here. She marched to the ring and yelled at McMahon straight away saying, look, you idiot, I didn't want you to include Becky, but exclude me. I wanted everybody to be thrown into the same hat. She then demanded the title back, and you know what Stephanie did? She just gave it to her. So that was a big fat wasted dime. That then changed fast lane instantly because Stephanie said, all right, cool, here's what we're going to do now. It is going to be Becky Lynch versus Charlotte. And if Becky Lynch wins, the main event at WrestleMania 35 will be a triple threat match. But if Lynch loses, she is gone forever. And I can only presume that means if Lynch is not victorious, WWE is going to kill her. Now, I like the end result, but how we got here was just absolutely crazy. And it was if somebody was just pulling decisions out of their ass. It matters not, however, because then Ronda turned her attention to the crowd and went absolutely batshit crazy on them. Now, I don't know if it was meant to be a heel turn, but it damn well should be because she got a mic and she was spitting fire, including going, what do you want from me? I risk my life to entertain all of you. I've respected this business from day one. And then how did you repay all that? By booing me in my hometown of Los Angeles. No one cares about all the positivity she's tried to put back into the wrestling business and they'd all rather cheer Becky Lynch instead. And she ain't wrong. Rousey then beat the crap out of everybody and she looked like an absolute killer doing it. And honestly, some of the shots she laid into Becky Lynch looked absolutely brutal and I don't know why, but for some reason, I find myself siding with Ronda Rousey throughout all of this and I love it when wrestling does that. I don't want that to happen, but that's what my guts are telling me, so I'm just gonna go with this. She's just so odd yet edgy at the same time. It's a bit like watching a Fruit Loop, but a Fruit Loop that I enjoy. After all of this fallout, you would have expected the show to just go off air, but we didn't and we cut to Stephanie McMahon who had run backstage to do an interview and that was just a bunch of tripe too. It was the equivalent of watching a movie and somebody explaining what you'd just seen and the potential fallout. She was like, well, maybe Becky Lynch will do this and maybe Charlotte will do that. And all oh, Ronda, I'm mad at her now, but she's going to be a factor. And maybe at WrestleMania, we get a triple threat or maybe we get a singles match. What are you doing? Whatever though, this remains the best thing on WWE TV and you've got to believe that come next week, it's going to be official and the main event of WrestleMania 35 will be Ronda Rousey, the champion, taking on Charlotte Flair, who will also take on Becky Lynch. I mean, how they get out of that fast lane match without screwing Charlotte, I don't know. But given that Ronda Rousey is now bonkers, I think it could work out all right. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Then like the video, share the video, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, because otherwise you won't know when other videos go live. Then go over to whatculture.com, read some articles with your eyes. You can even say the words out loud with your mouth if you wanted to feel like a relationship. And follow What Culture on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for watching, and I missed you last week. It's lovely to be back. And I'll see you again tomorrow when we up those downs for Smackdown. Oh yeah, also, also, Tamatonga and the Bullet Club. I've seen what you've been doing. I saw what you've been doing in ups and downs and on what culture in general. Don't worry about it, my friend. Do you think I went away and didn't come up with some plans on my own? I absolutely did. So you better start watching your asses, because soon you'll know. Trust me.